Hi, good morning. Oh, thank you so much for showing up. I am so happy to be here. And I do tons of these things, and I always think nobody is going to show up. Um, so thank you for being here and not letting my nightmare come true, basically. Um, thank you so much to Lance for inviting me to come. Thank you so much to sound crew and lighting crew for getting this amazing space. Uh, to Ray, everybody for, for organizing this. So to start, um, I would love it if we can just take a couple of deep breaths. So will you, will you humor me and um, just put your both feet on the floor and sit up tall, maybe not leaning back on the chair, maybe sitting up. And lowering your gaze or maybe closing your eyes if you're okay with that. And lengthen through the spine. Maybe tuck the chin a little bit, but drop the shoulders away from the ears. And let's just take a couple of deep breaths here. Maybe you had a really busy morning getting out of the house, maybe you're still pretty amped up from that awesome game of rock, paper, scissors. So just taking a couple of breaths to land here. And if your mind is still bouncing all around, totally okay. Just notice what it feels like to be in your body, to breathe. Maybe you're noticing movement in your belly, belly puffs out on the inhale, and you can draw your belly button back towards the spine on the exhale. Relax the jaw. And take one more deep breath in through the nose. Open the mouth, sigh it out. Good, again, inhale through the nose, sigh it out. <sighs> Good, one more time, inhale, and then let it all go, everything you don't need. There you go. You can let the eyes open. Awesome, thank you. It seems like this is you know, an audience participation thing or something I'm doing for you. Honestly, these things make me nervous. So it gives me a minute to take a couple deep breaths at the beginning. Um, so it seems like it's for you, it's actually for me, so thanks. So my name's Lisa Jacob, and I love this topic of Lost. I am uh, really excited to, to dive into this. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and, uh, and my history. So when I was four years old, my path was pretty much set. So I was an actor. Um, this was my first headshot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a resume before I started kindergarten. So I was four years old. I was in a farmer's market with my parents outside of Toronto. I'm Canadian. And there was a guy who walked up to us and he worked for a company, he had written this commercial, and he wanted me to be in it. We were not movie people, right? We were just normal people. This was something really unusual. So I think my parents pretty much just quickly ushered me away, concerned that he was some sort of like random pervert or something. But he gave them his card. And a couple of weeks later, my parents called, just out of curiosity. Turns out it was legit, and they asked me if I wanted to come in for an audition. So my parents sat me down and they talked to me about it. Now, I, I was four <laughs> at the time, um, so I always say it's kind of like asking a dog if they want to go for a ride in the car. You know, it's like the dog's going to be like, yeah, sure, like park, vet, whatever. 
Um, I was four. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I was like, yeah, audition, sure, sounds great. So I went to this audition. From the audition, they sent me to a talent agent. Talent agent sent me to more auditions. The whole thing snowballed, and I had an 18-year acting career. Not a whole lot of thought went into it. It's just kind of what happened out of this really random encounter. So this was what my life looked like. I was in some films that did well in the box office, Independence Day, Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, that's me at the top peeking out from behind Robin Williams' breast. Um, I got to meet Princess Diana. I did a lot of really cheesy TV movies in which I was just sort of like disgruntled teen. Um, so that's the like chip clip in my hair scenario we have going on there. Those shows pretty much only did well in Denmark. Um, that uh, the top one there is a, a Cottonelle toilet paper commercial. And that is actually my first memory. I remember standing there, and there was a man who was on a ladder who had this huge cardboard box of, of cotton balls that he was dumping on my head. And I remember looking up at him and going, that's a job? <laughs> like, my job is equally weird, right? My job is to pretend to be delighted that there are cotton balls falling on my head. But like, that's a grown man, and that's his job. <laughs> So that, yeah, I was about four um, in that Cottonelle commercial. Um, that's just, I mean, lo God love the 90s, right? Like that one, that was my, my headshot in sometime around 1992. Um, so this was my entire life. This is what I did. I didn't really go to school very much. I worked. And for the most part, I liked it. I liked my job. I got to meet wonderful people, I got to travel, I got to have really great experiences. But it was my path. I stayed on the path that was set for me kind of randomly when I was four. So there's something else that I think is important to know about me, which is that I have anxiety. I have a panic disorder and I have occasional depression. I am highly sensitive. I am very emotional. So there are a lot of things that make me anxious. Here are some of those things. So the flip cup of the shampoo bottle makes that like really loud sound that startles me every time. So I have to like unscrew the cap and dump out the shampoo, which means it falls out everywhere. But that's one thing that startles me. Um, also, bright lights caused my heart to race, so we had to install dimmers in every room in our house. Got to tell you, the lighting test for this this morning, really fun for me. Um, cancer. Cancer is something I worry about a whole lot, that everybody I love is just going to die of pancreatic cancer. Um, I once read a book about the 1915 sinking of the Lusitania. It ruined Thanksgiving for my entire family because all I could do for days was sob about how sad it was that everyone died on the Lusitania in 1915. Also, waiting in line, Whole Foods, terrifying, right? Panic attack, city, Whole Foods, line. So this is just part of who I am, highly sensitive, anxiety, panic disorder, occasional depression. This has been my life since I was a kid. Anybody else in here deal with any of these things? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. So this stuff is very common. A lot of us don't talk about it. But this is something that I've always had to manage. Sometimes I manage it better than other times but it's always been a part of my life. So as you can imagine, red carpet events, a little challenging for me. Um, is that like the fakest smile you've ever seen? <laughs> right? I despise 
despise these things. But this was part of my job. This is part of what you need to do as an actor. You go to these events so that you can talk to the producers, so that you can schmooze with people, so that you can get your next audition, your next job, so you can go to the next event and talk to the next producer. It is an endless hamster wheel of trying to get to some level of success. No one actually knows what that means. So I would go to these red carpet events. I would do the things I was supposed to do as a young actor who was successful in Hollywood. Everybody else who looked at my life said, you have the dream, right? You have the golden ticket. This is what everybody wants, is the life that you have. But the problem was that I was spending an inordinate amount of time curled up on the floor of my closet, lying on a pile of shoes, sobbing. I was miserable. I felt like this all the time, a giant phony. I didn't want to be doing my job anymore. As I got older, I realized some of the more challenging things about the film industry, right? I was constantly being critiqued for my physical appearance, right? I was getting really tired of going to auditions and having them say, hey, Lisa, thank you so much for coming in. You're a great actor. You're just not pretty enough. I was really tired of feeling like I was constantly in competition with everybody around me. I wasn't sure that this was really what I wanted to be doing with my life. But anytime I would say anything to anybody about like, I, I, I might get out. Like, I might just leave. I might retire. I've been doing this for 18 years. Like, I might just be done. They told me I was insane that I couldn't possibly be walking away from all of this. But I felt like there must be a life I was passionate about out there somewhere. There had to be something where I felt like I was making the kind of contribution to the world that I could feel good about. I looked at my other actor friends, they loved being actors. I mean, it was everything that they wanted, and I didn't feel that way. And I thought, there must be something. I had no education. I was thrown out of high school on Mrs. Doubtfire, so that was ninth grade. Um, I, I had no plan. I had no skills. I didn't know what it could possibly be that was something that I really wanted, but I thought it must be there somewhere. So I left LA, cold turkey, retired from acting at 22 with a ninth grade education and no plan. But I knew I had to purposely lose everything to search for something that really mattered. So I left behind the only life I had ever known. I left behind the only job that I knew I could make money at, the only thing I was skilled at, and pretty much everybody was kind of annoyed at me because it seemed like I had just completely flipped off the film industry. So I moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. I didn't know at the time I was moving to the best place in the world. But I felt completely lost. Right? I got here and I had pretty much just taken a grenade, pulled the pin, threw it behind me and walked out of my life. So I was lost for <laughs> quite a while. And I tried a lot of things. I, well, I eventually got my GED and I went to college, UVA. And I tried a bunch of things after college. 
So I did communications for nonprofits for a little while. I worked as a radio DJ for a bit. I did all of these things to try to find myself, to try to be less lost. And in the end, there were two places that I didn't feel lost, on the page and on the mat. I have been a writer since I could hold a crayon. It's how I process the world. It's how I figure out what I think about things, how I mourn, how I celebrate, I write things down. And I started practicing yoga when I moved here. And I found when I was on the mat that I felt less lost. I felt like I could connect with myself. I felt like I had a purpose. And I didn't really know what the connection was between these two things, but I kept coming back to the page, to the mat, to the page, to the mat, because that's where I could feel grounded. So really, it's pretty simple why those two places were where I felt better. It's because writing and yoga are all about getting present. So all of us have a monkey mind, right? Our minds bounce around from one thing to the other all the time. Past, future, worrying, list making, critiquing. We're constantly dealing with this monkey that is swinging from branch to branch and being honestly very obnoxious and like screaming and sometimes throwing feces, right? Like having a human mind is exhausting. So monkey mind is a term that Buddhists came up with 2,000 years ago, right? So it's not the fault of our iPhone that we can't get present. This is the condition of having a human mind. And so when I'm writing, when I'm doing yoga, I am paying attention, right? Athletes, artists talk about this. It's, it's being in the zone. It's being in flow when we're really present, when we are here, we're not lost. Interestingly enough, anxiety and depression, very much related to this. One definition of anxiety and depression, depression, obsessing about the past, anxiety, obsessing about the future. What's helpful for both? present moment awareness. We can only be lost if we're trying to get somewhere else, right? So where is it that we're trying to get to? We have this idea that there is like success land or happiness fill. Once we get there, we're going to be good. Once we get the next promotion, once we're in the next relationship, once we're in the next tax bracket, then everything's going to be okay. Right? How many times have we said, oh my God, things are crazy, but after next weekend, it's going to calm down. Does it calm down after next weekend? No, because next Monday happens. And then we start all over again, and it's four years later, and we're like, Psh. it never calmed down. Because really, if we're thinking about destination, all of us have one destination, one place we're ending up, right? Death. Sorry, it's morbid. I'm a little bit morbid. That's where we're all headed. We can't get lost on the way to death. So why not be present while we're here? The antidote to feeling lost is getting present. This is all we've got. There is nothing guaranteed. We have this one precious life. We're all headed to death. So 
Why not decorate the dungeon with flowers while we're here, right? Why not be here for every moment of it, regardless of if it's good, if it's bad, however we want to judge it? Let's be here for it. Like, just here, just now. Maybe it'll help us feel a little bit less lost. Thank you so much. So uh, I have written uh, two books. So the first one um, is the memoir, and the second one all about anxiety and depression. And I'm working on the third one, yeah, which is um, actually sort of about creativity and the creative process. And it, it has a lot to do with what I've noticed about the, the connection between writing and yoga, which I feel like when we talk about creativity, we talk about it from the neck up. Like, it's this entirely mental process. And we have, like, all of this stuff going on, which we don't think about. You know, we're hearing more about mind-body connection the mind and the body were never separate to begin with. So it only makes sense. I mean, it's all one thing. It's like a tree and its roots. It's not separate. So it's about how do we integrate the body into the creative process and, and how do we kind of use that. So yeah, thank you. I talk a lot on my social media about how I use yoga and meditation to help with my anxiety. And so one day I got an email from a man named Car Carl Salazar, and he runs a program down in Texas called Expedition Balance. And so he sent me a note and said, look, I, you know, I follow you on social media. I see that you talk a lot about yoga for anxiety. I run this program down here in Texas out of Houston where we do yoga and meditation retreats for combat vets. We go out to this ranch in the middle of central Texas. It's a 3,000 acre cattle ranch. And we take these vets. It's completely paid for, um, for the vets, so it's free for them. And most of them have never done yoga before. And it's this, you know, four or five day expedition that we do and I thought it sounded fascinating he was like you know why don't why don't you come down to Texas and check it out I'm like I don't know anything about veterans like I've never worked with vets I don't really know any vets this is gonna be a terrible idea like some civilian chick just shows up like hi I love yoga too um, but I, I I went down and I I got involved with the, the nonprofit and started working, teaching not only therapeutically focused yoga, but therapeutic writing with these, these men and women that, that come on the trip. And I got to tell you, it is now an incredibly meaningful part of, of my work and my life because I absolutely love the program and being able to see the, the progress that they make even in these four or five days, like the camaraderie and the bonds, and they maybe get a little bit into yoga, and maybe they don't, and that's okay either way, but it's another tool for them to use to deal with, with the lingering trauma. A lot of them have a number of, of major physical issues that they're dealing with, so you know, chronic pain, things like that, and it really is helpful for them to, to investigate other options. So, yeah. It's so easy to get lost in your day. I am a huge believer in schedules and boundaries. And so when I'm writing, I have really strict writing hours. And that's something that I have found to be just incredibly helpful for keeping me on task. Um, so when I set those writing hours, nothing else happens in those hours. Okay, one other thing happens in those hours, which is walking the dog, but that's the dog, and okay. So I will walk the dog, but other than that, like I'm not, 
I'm not doing laundry at the same time. I'm not screwing around on Instagram. I'm not, you know, deciding like, oh, there's a below deck marathon on Bravo. I'm going to do that instead. Like, I really do stick to a pretty strict schedule. And that's something that, that definitely helps me a lot. Also, I have, um, so I'm, I'm majorly into meditation. I've been meditating for about 10 years. And so meditating at the beginning of the day really helps me to kind of set the tone for the day. And then also something else that I do that I find to be really beneficial is that Thich Nhat Hanh, I don't know if you guys, if you're interested in meditation, Thich Nhat Hanh, read anything that he has written. He is a Vietnamese monk and he has Plum Village out in France. And I heard that they do this in Plum Village and so I started doing it, which is, I, you know, I use the, the timer on my phone and I have it ring this like really sweet little bell five times a day. And so it will ring at certain points and it's a really good check-in for me to be like, okay, this is how far I am through my day and what did I want to get done? Have I gotten enough stuff done? Have I made time to rest? Have I made time to do the things that are truly important to me in terms of like self-care as well as what are the things I want to accomplish work-wise. So having that just automatic little check-in throughout my day is really helpful for keeping me on track because it's so easy, especially just, you know, we always have our phones with us to be like scrolling and realize, oh my God, two hours are gone. And you know, I, I get really lost when I, when I feel like I haven't been as present and intentional with my day. So that little thing of having, having bells is very helpful for me. Yeah. So one thing that, that can come along with sensitivity is being an empath, which is where you just suck up everybody else's stress and anxiety and depression and all those sorts of things. So that's something that I've definitely had to figure out how to work with. The short answer for that is that self-care is really, really important. But I think in terms of dealing with being a, a highly sensitive person, I think the f most important thing about that for me has just been accepting that that's the truth of who I am and not beating myself up about it and actually realizing that even though I tend to think about it as something that makes my life more difficult, it's actually kind of a superpower. It's actually something that makes me incredibly empathetic. It makes me uh, a better yoga teacher. It makes me a better writer. It makes me a better workshop leader. It, it makes me better at all the things that I love to do. And is it challenging to go through life being like three seconds and a dog food commercial away from tears at every moment? Like, yeah, it's hard to feel like I have six fewer layers of skin than everybody else. But it also makes the things that I love to do better and more meaningful. So I think making that mental shift of like flipping the script a little bit and being like, yeah, this is, this is something that I have to deal with that maybe, you know, you know, my husband doesn't deal with that, right? Like that's not an extra thing that he has to deal with, but it is an extra thing that I have to deal with. But that doesn't mean it's bad. So that's been, um, I think, really profound for me to change my mind about that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.